Thanks very much for the honor. It's wonderful to be here. It's humbling to think of the lecturers who've come before me in this important lecture series. And it reminded me of a story of Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, Jr., who boarded a train once, and when the ticket taker came to collect his ticket, he, he searched in his pockets, and he couldn't find it, and he couldn't find it. And finally, the, the guy said, don't, don't worry, Justice Holmes, we know who you are. And he said, the question is not who I am. The question is, where am I going? <laughs> Public health aims to improve the health of as many people as rapidly as possible. And if you look at the US and the world over the past 100 years, public health has accounted for most of the health progress. And if you think about what the future might bring, it is likely, if it plays its cards right, to account for most of our health progress in the years to come. In the US, in the 20th century, by one estimate, the life expectancy increase of 30 years was attributable uh, in the case of 25 of those 30 years to public health. In global health, we've seen a tremendous improvement with a doubling of life expectancy in the 20th century with notable exceptions for HIV in Africa, an epidemic which, like the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, was large enough to actually move the mortality curve for an entire population. But with that uh, devastating exception, uh, the life expectancy globally has doubled. Life expectancy in the US has increased steadily. If you look uh, at between 1980 and 2000, in uh, the United States, cardiovascular disease deaths were cut in half. And if you look at the cause of that uh, having of cardiovascular death, about half of that, uh, an article, by the way, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2007, by a CDC author, about half of that was caused by uh, community-wide improvements in health status and another half by clinical interventions. Looking back at the 124 previous lectures in this series, I'm uh, stunned, really, by the breadth and depth of the, article, of the, of the uh, issues covered. Um, in public health, we often try to boil the most complicated questions down to a two-by-two -two table. In the case of an outbreak investigation, that's ill, not ill, exposed, not exposed. But there is another way of, of having a two-by-two -two table, and that would be to think about uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases and domestic and global issues. And for each of these four quadrants, there are critical issues that public health and clinical medicine can work together very closely on. Now, of course, there's an interconnection between them. We now know that many cancers are caused by infectious agents. We also know that people with chronic disease are more likely to have infections and to have worse outcomes from infections. We know that, for example, uh, there's an association between tuberculosis and tobacco use. Uh, but fundamentally, I'd like you to keep this, these four quadrants in mind as I go through a bit about what may be the future of public health in the coming uh, 124 years. And uh, <clears throat> before going into any specific issues, I wanted to give you a sense of uh, how uh, public health as a field thinks about things, because sometimes it is a little bit different than how clinical medicine thinks about things. And I think there are four essential concepts that underlie much of public health thinking. And uh, the fourth of them, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, is what I think is essential to public health and which I think can have a tremendous impact at improving health outcomes and clinical care. But the first is globalization. We are all connected by the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the planes we ride on, and if anyone needed a reminder of that, Ebola probably helped. Uh, but in addition, uh, we're connected by ideas that move around the world where we can understand a problem, a solution, an approach, or some other aspect of health or health improvement. Uh, the second basic concept is the critical importance of the intersection of health care and public health. Many years ago, when I was an epidemic intelligence service officer at CDC, and I was working on 
uh, outbreaks of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in hospitals throughout New York City. Uh, and we were having some challenges getting infection control improved in healthcare facilities. Some things never change. Um, <clears throat> I, I found that there were some challenges there and we were working on how to get a better interaction between the health department and the public health and the academic medical centers. And one of my mentors at CDC told me something that was very reassuring. He said, you know, <clears throat> between public health departments and academic medical centers, there's a long tradition of mutual disrespect. <laughs> But the fact is that there's a lot that we can learn from each other, and there's a lot that we can do to be more effective. But all too often, public health and healthcare are going in different orbits. And by working together, I think we can get more done than either field can individually. Now, the third theme is of a hierarchy of interventions, of factors that affect health. We think of things uh, starting at the most basic level of socioeconomic factors, poverty education, housing, inequality. And one line above that <clears throat> are things that uh, change the context to make default decisions the healthy choices. That might be fluoridation or chlorination of water, uh, elimination of trans fat, for example, uh, iodization of salt or smoke-free places. This makes it so it's harder to do something that's going to make you sick. So you could educate everybody to boil their water, or you could just uh, provide clean water. So changing the default value, changing the context is the next. At the next level of intervention are long-lasting protective interventions. The classic here are immunizations, but also things like brief intervention for alcohol use or cessation of uh, uh, cessation treatment uh, for tobacco use or colonoscopy uh, with polyp removal. So you have interventions which require an intervention of the healthcare system that doesn't have to work every day, all year round. It just has to touch people uh, occasionally, maybe in some cases once in their life, to protect them. At the next level are clinical interventions that require long-term care, uh, blood pressure control, cholesterol management. These are things that uh, require a great deal of effort. And at the, at the next level are counseling and education, uh, <coughs> exhorting people to eat healthier, be physically active. Now, each of these levels is important, and an overall public health program is likely to try to touch each of them. But quite frankly, those at the bottom are much more effective than those at the top, because essentially they require less individual effort, and they reflect a collective responsibility to making the environment such that if you just go with the flow, you're not going to get sick from a preventable cause, and that's what public health tries to achieve. Now, the bottom line of what I want to emphasize here um, is that in public health, what we try to do uh, is to keep in mind the population impact of our activities. Now, the definition of an epidemiologist is someone who loses sleep over denominators. <laughs> but I think the bottom line for the future of public health is that we will need an obsession with both numerators and denominators in each of these four quadrants and a way to work with clinical medicine to try to increase our population impact. Now, I'll start with infectious diseases in the United States. And a few years ago, one of our most talented physicians at CDC, Dr. Arjun Srinivasan, uh, came to my office and he said, Dr. Frieden, we have a problem and we're extremely concerned about it and if we don't move urgently, uh, we may have a real catastrophe on our hands. It's not often that somebody comes to the CDC's director's office and says that and he wasn't even asking for money. Um, <laughs> But he was talking about CRE, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, which I'm sure many of you are all too familiar with. Uh, this is a true nightmare bacteria. Uh, with uh, mobile genetic elements, it can transfer resistance to essentially all known antibiotics between organisms. It has a mortality rate in hospitalized patients of up to 50%. Um, and it spread from one 
state in the U.S. to virtually every state in the U.S. It is currently limited largely to hospitals, but if it gets out into the community, then routine urinary tract infections, pneumonias, wound infections will be problematic to care for, to say the least. And even more concerningly, much of medical care currently depends on the ability to treat infections which we anticipate as kind of the price of doing business or the normal course of events, cancer chemotherapy, some of our modern treatments for arthritis, organ transplant, um, dialysis. All of these routine, now routine situations, 600,000 Americans get cancer chemotherapy each year, are routinely complicated by infections, and we just assume that we will be able to treat those infections because we always have been for all of our careers. But we do face a potential future where we go not from the pre-antibiotic to the antibiotic era, but from the antibiotic era to the post-antibiotic era. And we're there already for some organisms and some patients. And unless we do more quickly, unless we turn that tide, we're going to see an inexorable rise and spread into the community of infections that may undermine or make much more difficult much of modern medicine. Now, my doctor, my father, who was a cardiologist, um, Julian Frieden, uh, used to say that when you see how other doctors practice medicine, you realize how resilient the human body is. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, we're now testing the limits of that resilience. And what we need to do is have programs in every community that address antimicrobial resistance. That means stewardship programs in every hospital. That means tracking outbreaks so you can stop them. That means detect and protect programs. We can reverse this. In Florida, they cut CRE by half just by following core infection control guidelines. Other antibiotic-associated harms, such as C. difficile, kills 15,000 Americans each year. Uh, we cut that, the UK cut that in half simply by better antimicrobial stewardship. You could probably cut it more with environmental cleaning, outbreak detection, and control. But no one hospital, no one facility can do this alone. You will be reliant on what happens at the nursing home down the street, the hospital across town, the doctors on staff. So there's an essential role for public health as a convening and coordinating entity to decrease drug resistance. And in fact, this is what we are proposing to do over the next five years, if funded by Congress. Um, we would uh, have an extensive program in every state, support centers of excellence, expand testing, find outbreaks, have a multi-component program. We think we can cut C. diff by 50 percent, we can cut CRE by 50 percent, we can reduce many of the other serious problems substantially. There are other areas where we're not so sure and we're going to need to learn more how we can drive hospital-associated or healthcare-associated infections down. But we think over the course of five years we would be able to prevent a half a million infections, thousands of deaths, and billions of dollars of medical care costs that are avoidable. Now, it's not only about drug resistance when we think about infectious diseases in the United States, and there are many others. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll mention uh, just one more, which is HIV. Over the past few months, our team has looked at HIV in a little town uh, in Indiana, uh, Scott County, the town of Austin. There are uh, 4,200 people who live in Austin, Indiana, and they uh, currently have diagnosed more than 140 HIV infections associated with injection drug use in this town of 4,200. That is more H that is more injection drug use associated HIV infections than occurred in all of New York City last year. A single uh, infection with HIV results in health care costs in excess of $400,000. More than 80% of the people are infected with HCV. Uh, care of HCV is about $50,000 a year. So you're talking about 
minimally uh, $90 million in costs for this town of 4,200 people, and this is a sentinel health event. We are awash in opiates. We have not got right the balance between risks and benefits. By all means, for palliation of someone with cancer, we need to treat their pain. But for chronic pain, back pain, headache, you'd be hard pressed to prove that the benefits of prescription opiates outweigh the risks of what are, of what are clearly dangerous drugs. A few doses result in addiction, a few doses too many result in respiratory suppression and death. Over the past 10 years, 145,000 Americans died from overdose from prescription opiates. So one of the ramifications of that is this outbreak, this horrific outbreak of HIV. We have never seen anything like this documented in rural America in 30 plus years of HIV. And there are hundreds of other communities that have similar profiles and could have similar problems. So just as uh, we heard about the different two phases of uh, TB, if we're not careful, we're going to have another age of HIV increasing in rural America and other communities throughout America. Now, in terms of HIV, uh, the cascade, as we call it, or a continuum of care, is, is something to really think about. And it's going to come up again as I talk about other diseases. So it's, a, it's worth thinking about for a moment. Uh, if, you, if you take the 1.1 million Americans who are diagnosed, with, who are living with HIV, most of them have been diagnosed, 86%. But most of those diagnosed have fallen out of care. So it's not enough to diagnose, you have to treat as well. Uh, similarly, hepatitis C. Uh, most people uh, don't know they're positive, and those who know, most are out of care. But, but think about this now. Only less than one out of three Americans living with HIV has their infection adequately treated. And current guidelines essentially are that test and treat. Everyone who's positive should be treated. You know, usually when you find an infection, you like to treat it. And it's increasingly clear that there are negative long-term health consequences of not treating HIV for the individual, certainly for their contacts, but for the individual as well. Now, there are many new approaches in the infectious disease control world. I think one of them that's very exciting is advanced molecular diagnostics where we will be uh, learning so much more about the microbiome. We'll be learning so much more about uh, uh, how organisms spread within communities. Um, we'll be learning so much more about what's really happening when an infection occurs in the body. And for this, I think we all need to have a great deal of humility. Because if we think about what we do in microbiology, we take an organism, we plate it out, we see what grows. Well, there's nothing that says that what's growing is the predominant subspecies or quasi-species of what's pathological in your lungs or bloodstream or elsewhere. So there's a lot we're going to learn from, this new, from these new genomic tools and from the kind of bioinformatics that are going to be required to analyze the tsunami of data that's coming with this. But, uh, all of that is going to only be as effective as core epidemiology is at identifying the clinical syndromes, the epi epidemiologic patterns. It's a tool, not a replacement, of basic clinical skills and basic epidemiologic interventions. Now, going from the infectious diseases in the U.S. to the infectious diseases around the world, I'd like to tell you a story of a meeting I had with a man named Carol Stieblow. He created much of the world's approach to how to treat tuberculosis. Uh, I was made director of the Bureau of Tuberculosis Control in New York City uh, in 1992, and he came about seven months later to visit. And uh, in the course of that visit, he asked me a question that changed my life. Steve Lowe came and he looked at our information summary and analyzed the information that I had spent a lot of time analyzing, and in just a few hours, he noticed a number of trends that I had missed, which was galling enough. Uh, but then he said, uh, now, Dr. Frieden, I've read your information report. Last year, you diagnosed 3,811 patients with tuberculosis. Yes, and this book tells me all about them, it tells me their country of origin, their type of tuberculosis, and many other things, but it, it actually doesn't tell me the most important thing. 
I was a little bit offended. I said, well, what, what's that? He says, how many of them did you cure? And I didn't know. And I was terribly ashamed. And the next day began a systematic cohort review process. Now, Steve Lowe took this approach all over the world. And the unforgiving prospective cohort approach basically says for every single patient you diagnose, you are responsible for their outcomes. He said, TB control is very simple. There's just one rule, no cheating. And that means uh, that in the TB world, we define all patients' outcomes as either they were cured and you documented their, their cure, they completed their treatment but you couldn't get a follow-up culture, they died, their treatment was unsuccessful, which should never happen but does happen sometimes, or you lost them, you couldn't find them. Now, that fundamental simple concept of how are we doing with every single patient we've diagnosed transformed the world of tuberculosis. And when uh, Dr. Karen Brudney looked at that for one hospital in New York City, the answer was 11%. Now ultimately, we came to cure almost everyone and were able to dramatically reduce tuberculosis in New York City. And that approach was central to the global approach to reducing tuberculosis, which involves standardized treatment, directly observed treatment, an accountable system so you know what's happened to every single patient. That's losing sleep over denominators. Not how many are you treating today, but what proportion of all of those you diagnosed have you treated successfully. Now what's happened in tuberculosis over the past 25 years is that the mortality rate has fallen by about a third in both HIV-associated and non-HIV-associated tuberculosis. The difference between uh, what could have happened without an expansion of Stieblow's system and what did happen over the past 20 years is 10.9 million lives. So that simple approach of unforgiving prospective cohort evaluation drove improvements led programs to recognize that directly observed treatment and standardization of care were essential, that team-based care and getting the frontline health workers to do the diagnosis and treatment and observation would be essential. Um, and that kind of care is absolutely crucial. And I'll say that in my own work in New York City, I learned a great deal about this from one of our outreach workers. He was a Nigerian man who we hired as an outreach worker, Christian Nwiwi. And he was a salesman by trade, but we trained him to be an outreach worker. And I'll never forget one patient I had, uh, a young man who had hemophilia. Fortunately, this was 1994, uh, was not HIV positive, but he was uh, undocumented. He was working in an illegal factory, and he had isoniazid-resistant tuberculosis, so the uh, standardized treatment for that is thrice weekly treatment with four drugs for six months uh, by directly observed treatment. He was from South America. I speak passable Spanish. I tried for an hour to convince him to participate in directly observed treatment. He refused. Um, because of these concerns about his documentation status, his factory, stigma, uh, he was on crutches, very hard for him to get around. Um, but Christian then met with him and convinced him and for nine months, sorry, nine months of treatment thrice weekly, uh, every single Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, met him a block and a half from his factory in the health department unmarked car, brought some food, uh, brought some uh, liquid for him, he took his medicines and went back on his lunch break uh, and got cured. And we cured his tuberculosis. Now, the thing about this that has always been so remarkable to me is that the patient spoke only Spanish and the outreach worker spoke no Spanish. Yet he was able to convey a deep concern and caring for this individual and build a bond and develop truly a friendship with him that allowed him to get the patient through nine months of thrice weekly treatment. This was successful. But this type of bond and this type of 
team-based care is going to be essential to better outcomes in, in any approach. Going on with infectious diseases globally, vaccination is uh, an amazing but unfinished success story. And if we think again about numerators and denominators, below the line here in blue are the number of deaths that are averted each year from the vaccines we give around the world. More than two million deaths averted every single year, children who don't die because of the measles vaccine, pertussis, tetanus, and a variety of other vaccines. But above the line is what goes into the denominator, the number of deaths that are still occurring in children that could be prevented by rolling out vaccination. Now, this data is a little out of date, and we're making more progress. The pneumococcal vaccination will cut deaths by hundreds of thousands a, of, uh, a year. Rotavirus diarrhea will cut deaths by hundreds of thousands a year. So we've got a, a lot more progress to make, but it's been a tremendous success story. One of the challenges of public health is trying to make clear the faces and the lives behind the numbers. It's easy to see the tragedy in a single person dying. It's hard to see the triumph and miracle of 10 or 20 million people alive because they didn't get a disease that was preventable. Um, we have uh, more room to grow, as I say, with vaccines. Um, we have vaccines that are being scaled up now that can prevent hundreds of uh, thousands of deaths more in future years. But if you look at measles just for the past 14 years, 15.6 million children are alive today who would have died if it weren't for this vaccination. And similarly, if you look at malaria, global malaria deaths have declined dramatically, primarily by reducing death among children under the age of five. And this is a combination of public health interventions, such as uh, insecticide-treated bed nets, and clinical interventions, rapid detection and treatment of kids and adults with malaria. Uh, now, infectious diseases are satisfying to treat because we're so able to prevent them and cure them in so many cases. Many of our vaccines owe a great deal to Maurice Hilleman, one of the people who's least known in the field of health. He worked uh, for uh, Merck and was responsible for devising or improving more than 25 vaccines, including nine that are uh, on the, of the 14 routinely recommended in the U.S. So that kind of impact is huge, and I think we've all had a reminder that infectious diseases are not dead with the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Um, that's shown us that we're all connected. It's shown us that a weak spot anywhere a weak link in the chain of disease detection and control can be a vulnerability everywhere. Now, we know that uh, the control of Ebola theoretically is very simple. It requires finding cases, finding contacts, isolating the cases, tracking the contacts. If they become sick, isolating them and then safely caring for people and safely burying people if they die. Sounds simple. Now try doing it in a place with no electricity, no running water, no internet, no cell phone coverage, 70 percent illiteracy, large uh, uh, elements of or parts of society that don't trust the government, and a, a, a near complete lack of core public health infrastructure. That reminds us how important it is to have that basic public health infrastructure to find and stop infectious diseases. And that's what the global health security agenda is about finding diseases rapidly when they emerge, uh, preventing them wherever possible, and responding immediately when they do emerge to prevent problems from occurring. There are two essential lessons we learned from the Ebola outbreak. First, every country in the world has to have a core set of uh, public health capacities that allows it to find a threat when it emerges, stop it promptly, and prevent it wherever possible. Second, when national capacities are, are overwhelmed, the world has to be able to move in a lot faster than it moved in here. Now, a lot was done in the Ebola epidemic. It's actually been the largest outbreak response in CDC's 70-year history. But it wasn't fast enough. There was so much needed so quickly 
exponential growth is very hard to get your mind around. But when cases are doubling every 21 days, keeping up with that with an, uh, response is very, very difficult. So we have important things that are needed to build national capacities all around the world and to build a global capacity for when national capacities are insufficient. It's not enough to have a, a global capacity. The national capacities will always be quicker, more efficient, and more cost effective. But you've got to develop systems that are used day in and day out, but can be scaled up in an emergency. Now, that's, um, that's the second uh, of those two boxes I showed at the beginning. The third has to do with non-infectious diseases. And I'll tell you a story from my time as health commissioner in New York City. We decided to put in electronic health records to cover most of the patients in the three poorest and sickest neighborhoods of New York City, Bed-Stuy, Harlem, and the South Bronx. And uh, in fact, it's been very successful. We've got a uh, million and a half patients on uh, prevention-oriented electronic health record. And as we began doing this, uh, the, the director of this team, Dr. Farzad Mastashari, and I sat down together and said, okay, we're, we're putting in these programs, what do we want to prioritize? And I said, well, just do a quick Medline search and figure out how can we save the most lives through healthcare? And he came back and he said, it's not there. You can argue that there's a group called Archimedes that has done some work that's kind of in this area, but it's quite striking. It's a very simple question. How, what are the interventions you could do through the healthcare system that would save the most lives? And we had then to get a graduate student and do it ourselves. Um, and it turns out that the, 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 uh, the data is still, is actually quite clear. For clinical medicine, uh, it is cardiovascular health, uh, far and away. Uh, and this uh, article from Tom Farley, uh, uh, Farzad, myself, and others shows basically what uh, happens when you go from the current rate of utilization of clinical services to an optimal rate. And on the y-axis, you see the number of deaths prevented per year in all-cause mortality. By far the single most important thing you could do is to better control blood pressure. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Of course, smoking cessation is a clinical intervention. There are public health interventions that can have a much larger impact on reducing tobacco use, such as increasing the tobacco tax, going smoke-free, running hard-hitting anti-tobacco advertising, as has been done here in Massachusetts and elsewhere. Um, but there are, of course, uh, new challenges as well. Uh, if we take, though, how we're doing with hypertension, and we ask that uncomfortable Stieblow question of how many of them did you successfully treat, we're only at 52 percent nationally. This is gold standard data. This is from NHANES. We go, we measure people's blood pressure multiple times on a random sample. This is as close as we will ever get to the truth. Why then, you may wonder, does my facility look so much better? because most facilities will say their rates are in the 60 to 65 percent range. And we were puzzled about this for some time, uh, because if you, if you look, the reports are consistent, 60 to 65 percent in HEDIS and other places, 50 percent or so on a community prevalence. And if you say, well, that must be the people who aren't in care. No, if you limit this to people who saw a doctor twice and have Medicare, numbers are basically the same, twice in the past year. Uh, we got a hint on this from some of the highest performing health systems in the country, uh, Kaiser, Geisinger, and others, which told us that, you know, when we really looked at the electronic health records, we found that um, about a third, nearly a third, of people who had multiple elevated readings were never diagnosed with high blood pressure and were never treated for it. It wasn't on their problem list. And that they were able to address by then putting in some automated reminders. But it, it showed us that there are many people hiding in plain sight. And that's why so many people, when we ask them, have you ever been told you had hypertension? Um, and we compare that with the number of people who doctors say they've told have hyper, or, or doctors care for and think have hypertension, the numbers don't match because there is this hiding in plain sight phenomenon, again, a denominator. So we've offered to healthcare facilities all around the country a triangulation tool. If you give us a bit about the demographics of your population, we'll tell you how many people you have with high blood pressure. Then if you look at the number you've diagnosed, and if there's a big difference there, uh, you may need to look more carefully. That's an example of being obsessed about denominators. Now, in order to address the non-communicable diseases in the U.S. and globally, um, 
we have to think about the changing context for health. And in doing that, uh, and thinking about how to make the healthy choice, the, the easier choice, we get into some debates about what is the appropriate role of government. And uh, again, in the New England Journal of Medicine, I, we tried to kind of sort out what that might look like. Uh, potential public health actions of a responsive government, of a government that tries to tell someone, we're not absolving you for resp of responsibility for your own health, but we are going to make it so that if you go with the flow, you won't naturally end up sick. And there are three core examples of that core public health approach. The first is promoting free and open information, truth in advertising laws, package inserts, nutrition facts panels. Uh, that's all well recognized now, not uncontroversial when they were all first passed. But there are other things on free and open information that are uh, now coming into play and sometimes controversial, such as public reporting of healthcare provider performance, calorie labeling at restaurants, graphic tobacco pack warnings. In the next type of activities of a public health response are protecting people from harm caused by others. That may be non-adulteration of food or laws against alcohol-impaired driving. Think about how the world has changed about drunk driving just in our lifetimes, from have a drink for the road to friends don't let friends drink and drive. That's a reflection of changing social norms that w enabled legal change but also was accelerated by legal change. Worker safety, taxes against tobacco and alcohol, but newer Ways of protecting people from others would be smoke-free laws, alcohol ignition interlocks that prevent someone who's been convicted of drunk driving from driving drunk again, uh, restrictions on sales and marketing of tobacco, especially to children, and elimination of artificial trans fat. The third category is in the nature of doing things together that we can't do at all or at least not as efficiently as individuals. Vaccination mandates, fluoridation of water, uh, micronutrient fortification for prevention of uh, developmental disability with iodine or uh, neural tube defects with folate, uh, clean water, clean air, clean food, elimination of lead in gasoline and water. These are big impacts, things that have made a huge uh, difference to the health of Americans. And the newer interventions, which are still controversial, may have to do with zoning, so it's easier to walk or bicycle, or school policies, or reducing sodium in packaged and restaurant foods. Now, the idea of who's responsible is part of what underlies this. 150 years ago, if you had tuberculosis, it was considered uh, by many that in some ways you had brought this upon yourself through your slothful behavior and that your behavior was responsible for your illness. At some level, that's the way we think about chronic disease now. That's the way we think about people who have uh, addictions or who have obesity, uh, though we may deny it. That undergirds much of our approach currently. Uh, and I think until that changes, until we recognize that it's not either or, we need to both ensure that we have a collective responsibility for health inducing environments and to prom promote individual responsibility for health of the family and the individual will have ongoing challenges. Now, at the global level, uh, non-infectious diseases are a huge problem. Many low and middle income countries are experiencing a double burden and for the first time in history, there are more people living in urban areas than rural areas, more people who are overweight than underweight, more uh, deaths occurring among adults than among children, there are higher rates of non-communicable diseases in, uh, in low-income compared to high-income countries, and even in low-income nations, chronic disease and injuries, with the exception of sub-Saharan Africa, now kill more people than infectious diseases. Tobacco remains the, lead, the world's leading cause of death, more than six million deaths per year. In this century, unless urgent action is taken, there will be a billion deaths from tobacco, Mike Bloomberg and his foundation have made dramatic strides reducing this. Their efforts to date will have prevented at least 14 million deaths, so huge impacts here, uh, but much more to be done. And the approach here is, uh, as outlined by the World Health Organization, empower a technical package of core interventions, monitoring tobacco use and policies, protecting people from tobacco smoke through smoke-free 
uh, laws offering cessation help for people to quit. Massachusetts made a tremendous progress there through the Medicaid program, warning about the dangers of tobacco through pack warnings and hard-hitting ads, and forcing bans on tobacco advertising and promotion sponsorship. I find it deeply troubling now that we're seeing massive marketing of tobacco products, specifically e-cigarettes, in ways that are very attractive to kids, and we're seeing an increase in the overall use of tobacco in kids as a result of this. And finally, raising taxes on tobacco, although the R here could potentially stand for regulation as well, as we think about what to do about nicotine. We know that the tobacco industry has uh, modified our, our own laboratories at CDC has, have documented how the tobacco industry has made nicotine much more bioavailable by increasing free nicotine, or crack nicotine, if you will. It's uh, more rapidly absorbed by the neurological system than is uh, intravenous nicotine, now that it's been optimized for addiction. Now, the uh, issue of numerators and denominators is one uh, that isn't unique to public health. It isn't unique to health care. Uh, I think uh, when we think about numerators, we think about treating patients as VIPs. When we think about denominators, we think about answering that question that Steve Lowe asked for any condition we're concerned about, whether that's high blood pressure or effective treatment of sickle cell anemia or any other clinical condition. So I think there are some important lessons from the public health world for clinical system improvement. One is consistency. Standardization of care allows improvement. It doesn't mean you have to follow without questioning what the clinical intervention should be. It does mean that for your practice or your facility, for common conditions, you should sit down and say, this is the way we intend to treat them. We will deviate from that if we want to. If we have a good reason, we'll document it. But at least let's standardize how we do that, where that can be done. An information system that allows rapid feedback and allows you to answer that Steve Lowe question, how did you do with every patient diagnosed? <laughs> Patient-centered care that allows engagement, involving the patient, uh, uh, gets more of a sense of reducing the barriers to care, uh, whether they're cost or distance or information or stigma or otherwise. Team-based care, and this is something that not all medical societies agree with, but I have to say there's really only one solution to uh, the problems of lack of access, high costs, lack of quality in much of our healthcare system. And that's a broader team-based approach where everyone practices at the top of their license by protocols that are overseen by physicians but result in greater access to care, uh, individuals, health extenders, if you will, um, nurse practitioners, physician assistant, nurses and others who are able, advanced practice nurses, who are able to provide care closer to the patient, who will go to rural areas where doctors won't go to, who will be able to provide more consistent care closer to patients for lower cost. That's the wave of the future. So as physicians, it would behoove us to embrace it and try to guide it rather than object to it. And finally, innovation, because all of our projects are going to require ongoing innovation. Uh, we have common challenges and intersections, issues like confidentiality, disease reporting, the role of industry, the role of environment and environmental change. Um, the challenge of clinical medicine is to have that same obsession with denominators, to think about the impact of one-on-one -on -one care on an overall health in the community. For that to happen, we need partnerships across many different sectors of society. Public health can't do it alone. Clinical medicine can't do it alone. Increasingly, we'll address the issue of health equity. Increasingly, we'll recognize that we have a collective responsibility to ensure both health-promoting environments and consistent, high-quality care. Increasingly, we'll recognize that for certain conditions, even a single case is unacceptable, that the numerator should be zero. Five years ago, it seemed impossible that India would get over the finish line for polio eradication, and yet they did. Polio is gone from India. When polio eradication started, the effort started in the late 1980s, 350,000 children became disabled by polio each and every year. 
Last year, less than 350 children in the world became disabled by polio. Three years ago, it seemed impossible that Nigeria would get over the finish line for polio elimination. But a rapid surge of CDC and global partners and effective action by Nigeria appears to have eliminated polio from Nigeria, even in areas where there is violence and insecurity. The last case of diagnosed polio in Nigeria was in July of last year. There may be clusters still, but uh, pretty good surveillance has not identified any. The only remaining major holdout is Pakistan. It accounts for 22 of the 23 cases diagnosed so far this year. Uh, but there's tremendous willingness on the part of the government and people and health workers of Pakistan to get over the finish line. And in terms of a numerator, there's nothing better than eradication, which is really the ultimate in both equity and sustainability, because it's for every single child for all of the future. And for the ultimate in denominators or accountability, it's being, being able to answer Steve Lowe's question for each of the conditions that we care for. Thank you very much.